welcome everyone to GeoHug. So before we kick off today's session, I'd just like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional lands which we're all coming from today. I live on the beautiful lands of the Gadigal, of the people of the Aurora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. And I am so excited about today's speaker, the wonderful Ian Stewart. So Ian is a busy man being a global champion of earth science. He has an impressive career being involved in a wide range of organisations and long-standing research interests in natural hazards, sustainable geoscience and earth science communication. And it's going to be absolutely incredible hearing from him today about exploring the power and significance of geoscience for a sustainable future. So it's going to be an absolutely amazing session. I hope you all enjoy it. Please use the chat and we'll be opening up the floor at the end. And yes, thank you so much, Ian, for joining. It's amazing having you. <laughs> Thanks for that, Jeff. That's a great way of softening up the speaker as well, because it's like, <laughs> fantastic to kind of follow Mike there. Yeah, so you obviously didn't mention my Baywatch uh, movie, which I should have thrown that in the bio. Yeah. How would, you, how would you know? So let me um, let me pull this up. That was my favourite photograph until Mike Magic Mike got in the act there. So that's now going to be. I'm going to have a new one. So, so yeah, uh, what I'm really interested in is uh, the narratives that we, the storylines that we tell for geology. Um, so over the last, I don't know, 20 years or so, I've been working a lot on how we communicate geology to society. And uh, and and really, the, the reason I'm interested in it, particularly at the moment, um, is because there's all sorts of discussions, and I know it's happening in Oz, it's happening in here in the UK and in Europe and also in, in America, about the kind of downturn basically in geoscience within universities. But also I think it's fair to say, uh, you know, starting to impact on companies as well about the pipeline coming through. And the result is, you know, in some cases, some geology departments, for example, Monash, for example, closing its geology, geology department. But, but there seems always to be a kind of, uh, I don't know, a kind of identity crisis about geology um, at, at a time when actually lots of people are interested in the planet. Which, so it seems perverse really that geology, you know, the study of the planet is, is struggling at this time in terms of getting students in from school to kind of study it and then kind of moving on down the pipeline to be professional geoscientists, particularly in the resource uh, sector. So there's a lot of headlines there in different places talking about it. The other aspect that's coming through is a lack of diversity in the, whether it's, it's uh, gender diversity, but more importantly, I, I think, or more problematically, uh, ethnic diversity, um, that, that basically geology seems a very narrow, traditional, conservative uh, subject. And that's that's sitting uncomfortably, if you like, in the, in the current climate. And so, what, what we're seeing is a lot of geoscience departments, you know, I'm an academic, so um, I'm interested in that that area, really. I do a lot of work with schools, I do a lot of work with industry, but I'm, I'm sitting in the middle. And so academia is struggling to know what, how to sell geology. And and what it's doing is it's rebadging and branding and, and looking around. And so, for example, almost all the petroleum geology courses that I know of have changed to be geoenergy or sustainable energy or whatever um, and that's telling us uh, something but it's part of a, I think it's part of a broader identity problem um, that that geology has so so basically as just mentioned basically since for about the last 20 years um, I've been taking that geology cake and cutting it in different ways for mass public audiences through to programs and they're a mixture of things so all the time you're trying to look at uh, an interesting narrative that takes you through. So sometimes it's about journeys around how they're around the planet. That was where we started. Some stuff about climate change very early on in around right about 2006, 2007. Um, then some general big picture things about the earth and its relationship to, to people. And more recently, uh, and even some stuff into the philosophy of geology, the kind of roots of geology, geological science. And then more recently into energy. And, and so... Here's the UK context. This is the advanced level. So this is in schools, geology students taking uh, both. So black is the total, uh, blue is uh, male, red is female since 1970. And what you see is a, a rise up basically when, the, you know, the, the basically the North Sea 
oil boom mix creates this amazing environment for people. I remember I did my degree. When did I do my degree? 80, undergraduate, 82 to 86. Um, so you can see that as I was finishing, there was a plummeting of number of geologists. And that's that demise really kept on going down and down and down, really to around about 10 to 2000. And we see it picking up a little bit. But it's a relatively short-lived pickup because around about 2014, 2015, it plummets again. And that's what everyone's worried about here about impacts on geology departments and then the through pipeline into, into the industry. So one of the things that I would say is that really from 2003 to 2016, you know, there was a lot, there was my programs, but it was other programs too, the, the Attenborough's programs about the planet um, and people like Chris Jackson coming along. There was a lot of television geology and yet still as a result, despite that high profile in the media, in, in kind of mass public audience, we see this big drop off. So, so what is it? What is it that's going on? For I don't think that having the uh, geology on the box, if you like, necessarily makes much of a difference. There's something deeper going on, I think. There. So, I took this photograph in um, in the uh, UAE in the Emirates, uh, where it was filming Planet Oil, and it, to me, this this idea of an impending storm coming up, where you know the the traditional conventional ways of looking at geology are certainly like this was about oil and the, the, the pressure on oil uh, in terms of the with climate change and the uh, and the energy transition, et cetera. What was the future of it? And I get this is the way that I kind of feel that geoscience is coming through. So the question that I ask really is, is yeah, what's the purpose of geoscience? Why, do, why are we doing geoscience? What is it for? Um, and in that sense, obviously, automatically, what you do, um, you put it into GPT, I don't know why, GT, you put it into chat GTP and you say, what is the purpose of geology? And up it comes with a very detailed thing. It's uh, the purpose of it is to study and understand the Earth's physical structure, process, history, blah, 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 rocks, minerals, landforms, oceans, and uh, gain insights into the Earth's past, present and future. And then that final bit, overall, the purpose is to deepen our understanding of our systems, process, history, make informed decisions about resource management, environmental protection, and resilience in the face of natural hazards. Pretty good, actually. I think most people would look at that and think that's a, you know, that's easily something that could sit into the brochure of a geoscience curriculum, to, you know, department. Um, but I'm kind of talking about purpose in a slightly different way, and the purpose in a business sense. So when you have uh, in a in a business context. It tends to be this idea of a, the pursuit of an ambitious, clear, enduring, and overarching goal. And then the critical bit, which is motivating, which motivates people to want to pursue, uh, pursue geology. And in that sense, if you then compare that idea where the, the way that business use purpose, and myself and uh, Victoria Hurth, who's a professor in marketing, I wrote a paper up about, about this in terms of the geoscience context about how we market and brand geology. The, the, uh, the description on the left-hand side doesn't seem very uh, clear or motivating. This is very kind of factual. So what are the motivating uh, elements, narratives that can come through? So um, if we go right back to the start, and by the start for me, it's usually Hutton's Theory of the Earth in 1788, the first... So this is Edinburgh back in the time when Hutton was uh, was starting to develop his seminal work, bringing all the elements of, of geology together. In his second paragraph, he talks about this globe of the earth is a habitable world and in its fitness for this purpose, our sense of wisdom and its formation must depend. In other words, the reason why we're standing there is past is because this place is habitable and we want it to continue to be habitable. So you could argue that Hutton, even if he didn't use the word sustainability or whatever, is thinking about this in terms of long-term uh, sustainability. Um, but of course, at that time, uh, on the other side of Scotland, so he was in Edinburgh on the other side of Scotland, James Watt was tinkering around with a steam engine. And as a result of that, we start getting the first stages of the Industrial Revolution, where uh, whether it's coal extraction, whether it's uh, metal extraction in, uh, in the southwest of the country, machines, steam-driven machines start to take over. And that is the, the mechanical age, the Industrial Revolution sweeps through where geologists are absolutely fundamental part of that. You know, a lot of geology is about finding stuff and getting it out of the ground. 
And I love this quote from Thomas Carlyle, which really epitomizes for me the intensity of the Industrial Revolution. We remove mountains, make seas or smooth highways. Nothing can resist us. <clears throat> We war with rude nature, and by our resistless engines come off always victorious and loaded with spoil. So you get a sense of just this machine of that geology is really feeding, kind of driving through. And so when we get into the 20th century, particularly the second half of the 20th century, but really throughout the 20th century, the idea is that the stuff that comes out of the ground is what drives the economy, and the economy is seen as the engine of well-being delivery. And what I mean by that is economic growth, uh, wealth creation, the idea is that that'll trickle down, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, and that that people around the world's livelihoods will rise. And, and we've seen that. That's demonstrably been the case. People's livelihoods, and, and there's been economic development around the world as a result of this, this push for, for economic growth. And the people who have been at the core of that have been the geologists. The problem is that at the same time as that, there has been this impact on the on the planet. So these are, this is referred to by uh, social scientists as the great acceleration. So on the left-hand side, that's from 1750 through to 2010, I think it is. Um, and in the red, it's the socioeconomic trends. And in the, the right, it's the... Um, our system trends. And what we see is around about 1950, post-war economic boom, the whole human planet and natural planet just goes into overdrive, really. So we start to produce, this is this part of this drive for economic growth, and it has this effect then onto uh, the aspects like methane release or ocean acidification, uh, fishing, uh, and of course, carbon dioxide levels, as we as we keep hearing about. So this great acceleration then is this notion that we're being taken from the planet to drive economic growth, but in the background, what that's done then is created all these, these kind of problems for us. Alongside this, many would argue that although um, there has been this great increase in economic wealth, the disparity between <clears throat> the the, um, the richest and the poorest has never been, <clears throat> excuse me, has never been greater. So social inequity, social inequality in the world has increased as a result of this. So um, the, that really leads us on to this notion that's very fashionable now, and it comes around, around about 2000 from an article by Paul Crutzen talking about the geology of mankind, the Anthropocene, the human age, that, that we've moved from this the Holocene, climate-driven uh, period of relatively calm, where civilization's been allowed to, uh, given the chance and the opportunity to, to spread, and then suddenly, very quickly, into the Anthropocene, which he was arguing was probably the steam engine from, from 1780s, it's, uh, James Watt. But most people would argue now that that has had a, an effect, but the imprint in the geology, the geological systems are relatively mute. And actually, the real impact comes in the 1950s with that post-economic boom. And so we end up with this situation encapsulated by the photograph at the bottom. So this is the Altiplano in Bolivia. It is a stunningly beautiful place, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Um, and it's UNESCO World Heritage Site and all the rest of it. But it also happens to hold 30% of the world's lithium uh, reserves. And so if we want to take that petrol driven, you know, combustion engine uh, truck Jeep and turn it into a nice, fancy electric uh, renewable energy EV, um, we're going to need things like lithium. And so the, the big moral and uh, ethical uh, aspects really of the, the Anthropocene is, do we dig this place up in order to create our renewable future or low carbon renewable future and these are questions not just for geologists in fact they're not questions for geologists they're questions for society at large but geologists are going to be the ones who are going to be asked to uh, kind of deliver on this and so it's an important debate for geologists um so one of the things that we uh we we know really from this earth system science that starts to come through in the 80s and 90s is just how fragile the planet is. So the upper image is, is the Earth with all of its water hanging like a ball on the, the right-hand side. So that's ocean water, that's salty water, it's everything that says water. And you can see it's actually not that big. And if we just took fresh water, it would obviously be very, very tiny. Um, and the same trick is played on the bottom left, really, with the atmosphere, the, the livable atmosphere, 
you know, wrapped up in a ball, stripped off there and hanging as a ball. And again, there isn't much atmosphere there. If we start messing with the chemistry of that, then there is a kind of a problem. So when you get to 2000, 2005, you get geologists that are starting to think about the planets as um, in terms of its health system, you know, having a kind of health check for how the planet's doing. And these are the, the in green really shows the, the, the main areas around the edge of the fundamental pro uh, parts of the planet that we absolutely depend upon. And the, and the bigger the, the sector shows, the more we've exceeded or we're pushing the system beyond its tolerance levels. So climate change is one of those. Biodiversity loss is seen as that. Nitrogen and phosphorus loading, those are the areas of prime concern. Uh, land conversion, so land degradation. And you can see others sitting in the background, ocean acidification, air pollution, things like that. So these are the big system parts of the earth that we are changing, humanity is changing, and it's probably not going to be very good. So they talked about, a, 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 this is the work of uh, Rockstrom, Johan Rockstrom at the, uh, the uh, Stockholm Resilience Centre in, in Sweden and other colleagues in Australia uh, and, and also, uh, well, around the world really, looking at what these, these fundamental elements, the parts of the system are. And they refer to a safe operating space for humanity. In other words, we shouldn't exceed these thresholds. But, and if we do, we're into uncharted territory and we have a problem. Uh, Kate Rayworth at Oxfam um, also was looking at it from a very different point of view. And she highlights the what she calls the social basement or the social foundation, which are the, the societal elements that we also need. And you'll see them in red in the inner parts so of food, health, education, uh, peace and justice, political uh, voice, so social equ equity, gender, housing. So... <clears throat> They, what you end up getting is a very, and her argument is, look, we can't drop below those those basements. And in many cases, as the red lines moving into our red sectors, moving into the center show, we're in some cases really moving in, uh, in problematic areas socially. So what you end up getting in white is what's referred to as the safe and just operating space for humanity. In other words, humanity needs to stay within that, those, those, that, those lines and that kind of that ring in order to be in a good place and it's increasingly not the case what's interesting is if you put it into the timeline going from left to right when it, 2000 brought in the millennium development goals and you can see them the updated millennium development goals are there but poverty ending poverty and hunger universal education gender equality health uh, global partnership and the one that related to the planet, one was just referred to as environmental sustainability. So these were broad goals. Um, and, and then, as I say, what happened, geologists, planetary people started talking about these planetary must-haves around um, the material, the resource base, air, clean air, nutrient cycles, hydrological cycles, ecosystem services, you can see them there, biodiversity, and of course, climate. And so one of the big arguments then was how do we, pull together this knowledge of what society wants in terms of poverty, hunger, education, so social dimensions of the future and sustainability with the planets must have, the fundamental aspects of the planet. And so the, the idea of, of sustainable development, which up until that bit, at time had been the development, developing development that meets the needs of the present while safeguarding the, uh, the current and future generations, was tweaked really to talk about development that meets, meets the needs of the present while safeguarding Earth's life support system on which the welfare of current and future generations depends. So the, the idea of the planet being fundamentally at the foundation of everything else was something that really came through 2010, re really in the run-up to the Sustainable Development Goals. And then the Sustainable Development Goals came in in 2015, and here they are. And so you may be very familiar with these, but if you look at them, the first thing that strikes you is, well, where's the planet, really? So there's very familiar terms in here. And you, if you look through, there's certainly things that uh, for geologists, we would say, well, that relates to us. So for example, <clears throat> well, it's got affordable and clean energy in there. Uh, we can talk about that. Um, but economic growth is there, infrastructure, innovation industry, uh, so stuff about sustainable cities, that's where, for example, uh, hazards and disaster science can arise. 
responsible consumption and, and production. Uh, so that's that idea of the circular economy there. So there's places where geology fit, um, but actually the idea of the planet as, in its totality as a planet system is missing uh, completely. So that's a, a real problem. Instead, what we have with the SDGs is a set a menu of these broad goals within which we have a number of explicit targets. And there's something like 150 or so targets sitting underneath these 17 goals. Very, very specific, but all equally weighted as if they all have the same importance, which seems a very strange situation off the back of our, our understanding about these thresholds in the Earth system. And the planetary boundaries are there, um, but they're tucked away. <clears throat> they're just another target, really. So under climate change, it talks about it's very, very willy on climate change for the reasons we can discuss later. Um, ocean acidification, it just talks about we must address the impacts of ocean acidification. It's not really a, much of a target. So they're there, but they're, they're surrounded and, and mixed in with 100, you know, 100 or so other targets about socioeconomic uh, uh, development. Um, and what there is no sense of really is the dynamic issue of what's been referred to as planetary tipping points. So these are elements of their system where if we lose these areas, <clears throat> if they're compromised, then <clears throat> it has a massive kick into the, the planet system. So it doesn't matter if it's the Greenland ice sheet or the Arctic sea ice. There's been a lot of debate, a lot of discussion this week about the Arctic sea ice, really uh, extraordinary low levels of Arctic sea ice at the moment. <clears throat> the permafrost melting and releasing methane into the atmosphere, the, the demise of the, the slowing down of the Atlantic uh, a hayline uh, circulation system that basically drives the ocean currents, Amazon rainforest, you can see them all outlaid there. <clears throat> There's no hint of those in the sustainable development goals. So uh, what I really wanted to kind of then go to is, it, it seems to me that there's a, that the geologists haven't been very successful at putting a narrative across about the importance of the planet and the planet system. And so we need uh, some new narratives, really, in order to address these issues that are set up at the start. What are those new narratives? Well, are, we, during lockdown, we were all kind of stuck doing things. And for me, what we, I ended up with um, uh, some, some Neil Evans and 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 Kamakwig from BHP, we started to just have talk, we just to, to sort of, bedroom and office talks with a whole bunch of different people, individual one-to-one -one interviews about uh, strategic thinkers in different areas about how they saw the future of geoscience. And you can catch these in a, a web page called, it's called Geoscience Futures. It's not all of them, we're starting to put them there. And these are interviews, kind of like this, a kind of podcast type interview um, with some of these, these major uh, speakers. So you might recognize some names there, Han, Han Hanghoj, is the director of the British Geological Survey. Chris Jackson, you may know, a geologist in the UK, professor, was professor, professor of sustainable geoscience now. Jacob Scott Tinker, energy uh, geologist in the US. Andrew McKenzie got a lot of grief this week because he's now the, was a direct, a chairman of uh, BHP. He's now uh, head of the board, chairman of the board at Shell. He was getting a lot of protests at their uh, AGM. A uh, lot of Tyler at BHP. Darrell Willis, interesting guy, he was, uh, a geoscientist, a geophysicist at BP, then went to Google as head of energy, and is now at Microsoft as head of energy. And there's a whole set more. So you can go and just uh, plug for Jess, because Jess, uh, crazy Jess, is going to take this on for GeoHug. And we're going to, we're going to put more and more of these uh, interviews up. Uh, but as I say, you can have a look at some uh, already that are there and just get a feeling about those discussions about where geoscience is going. But... In terms of the discussion, I want to break it into three areas. There was a lot of discussion, as you might expect, about the energy transition. The energy transition and the need for critical minerals, critical metals, is something that you hear a lot about in, uh, in, in geoscience. And so this is a, a really important area. And a lot of geoscientists see this as a critical narrative in order to uh, communicate. And we have a communication problem about this, as Scott Tinker talks about. You know, he says... The sun and the wind, well, they're renewable, heat and light and motion. But the stuff to extract that energy isn't. The wind turbines, solar panels, batteries aren't renewable. There's nothing renewable about them. We mine them, we manufacture them, and then we dispose of them in landfills or recycle. We do it again. And, and the idea that's so critical for people to begin to understand. So the role of that basically we're not going to be able to get the energy transition by just 
uh, renewable energy and and basically the the uh, the wires that's already in the in the system digging up the the, the existing uh, metal wires. Any future with less carbon in it is going to have a lot more mining in it, and that's a very unpalatable message for some to take. <clears throat> There's another um, general narrative around looking out for the planet, the planet as a system. And, and Nal McCormick, who was uh, direct, uh, chief geologist at BHP and is now in a geothermal company called Causeway GT in Northern Ireland, points out that, you know, what we look like to the public is something from 50 years ago out there to rape and pillage the planet. This image um, is not from the mining sector, which was really what Niall was talking about, it, but it's the um, it's the fracking site in Northern England. And certainly about five years ago, you know, if you said you were a geologist, anyone would say to you, what do you think of fracking? And it was very negative. So geologists have this, there's a toxic nature around geology because it's about you know digging holes in the earth and getting stuff out of the earth and poisoning the earth and all the rest of it well that's a big aspect that we have to come um deal with and here john van an anglo-american says you know the the single largest challenge that's out there that we know of for society for the next 30 years is how do we grow a prosperous world while taking care of the world at the same time this balancing act between the economic wealth and well-being of of society and and this, the planet on which fundamentally we depend is a really difficult uh, balance and act so that's an important narrative about what the role of geologists are are geologists the exploiters of the planet that get stuff out and delivers it to society to to create everything that they need or are we the the stewards the guardians of the planet because we understand its rhythms and sensitivities in other words if you're worried about the planet trust the geologist that's a that's two ends of a continuum but it's a difficult uh, discussion to have um Menakshi, Wadwa, Arizona State, planetary geologist, I love this quote, the big challenges that we face, those are humanity's problems. If there's any science that really kind of an impact globally, it's geology. It gives you the context of humanity's place in the universe. You kind of understand that the Earth is unique in many ways for our species, and we better take care of it. So this idea of geology has been the one to take care of the planet for society, I think is a very powerful narrative. And that then leads us, as intimated by, <clears throat> and actually into this idea of humanity. And it kind of relates back, I think, to Hutton's quote about the habitable earth. And this is from Denise Cox, who is, was uh, president of the APG, American Association of Petroleum Geologists. Geoscientists are earth scientists. We understand earth processes. We can address humanity's challenges, be excited about new discovery. We can make the world a better place. That idea of making it a better place is really important and chris jackson as i say prof in sustainable uh, geoscience at manchester and now at jacobs as, as head of the sustainable geoscience division talks about that the science of geology has to be increasingly people-centric you know it's not about just telling people are going to have a good job for 30 years or travel or money the people that are coming in these days want to do something transformational they can see the problems there and they want to see that geology is a subject that is about transforming the world. So when we go back to the SDGs, we see that one of the problems there is there's no narrative about what the world will be like if we manage to make some or all of these SDGs. It's kind of a shopping list of things that would be nice to do, but there's no compelling, motivating, purposeful narrative around the SDGs. Um, so what we end up doing is, and this is something that I've been involved in and very proud to be involved in, this is what uh, with a, the group through a UNESCO project, um, putting together, trying to work out how ge geology and geoscience um, fits with the SDGs. And you can go through each of the 17 SDGs and you can pull out aspects of geology that relate to that. But I just, but the emphasis I wanted to is, is really talk about the lack of a narrative. So this is the SDGs portrayed in a very different way where it talks about planet at the bottom and then the, the idea of the natural resource base, which talks to the idea of planetary boundaries. And then on top of that is the notion of prosperity and various SDGs that are about production, consumption, and equitable distribution. And then at the top of that, then above that, 
as is as a result of that prosperity is been able to address some of the people centered much more people uh, centered ones of poverty and human uh, well-being and with partnerships global partnerships put at the top so that's an attempt to reorganize that set of you know um squares into something that has a through-going narrative that's much more motivating. So in terms of geology, I want to leave you really with, with this, which is the way that I see it. And this is something I published uh, earlier this year in Nature Geoscience. And it follows something called Daly's Triangle. And Herman Daly was the chief economist in the 1970s with the World Bank. And his argument was that everything rests, everything that we do rests on, he called the ultimate means which is natural capital, the biosphere, the energy from the sun, water, and raw materials. That's what everything, life will not, would not even be on this planet if we didn't have things like energy from the sun, et cetera. So those are the ultimate means. And we can convert those ultimate means into stuff. And we do that through built and human capital. And we, we make things, we make tools, we fill factories, we drive essentially the economy. And that economic development then gives us health, wealth, mobility, you know, transport systems, knowledge, education systems, communications, everything that we think of as being the modern world. But he says it's a mistake to think that the purpose of the economy is to do that, is to create wealth. But what you're doing is you, you create those, those wealth creation, profit maximization is an intermediate end to the ultimate end for people, which is well-being. And you can see some of the elements of well-being uh, there about, you know, uh, the idea of fulfillment and identity of feeling self-worth, for example, self-identity, the, the ability to feel as if we've got purpose in our, our lives. It's not just about necessarily money. <clears throat> so fitting that back into the geology uh, kind of context in terms of narrative, I think in terms of the planet, we have some fundamental narratives about the importance of the planet in, in terms of maintaining the well-being of the fundamental resource base. And that's essentially resource sustainability, not overusing whatever resource we're talking about. And that, that's quite a lot of people that have done that. I think within the economy, we can see some very common narratives around the energy transition and circular economy. Geologists need to be in there, you know, really influencing the, the idea of how we can make the economy work better, more efficiently in order to help uh, you know, miss out the uh, adverse effects of resource sustainability. So we can drive prosperity without necessarily, you know, it, it's limiting economic development, economic, um, it, without that kind of, yeah, having that negative effects. But ultimately, I think, and again, those energy transition, circular economy, are your very common narratives you'll find that's getting pushed. I think what's less common is the idea of the well-being economy. In other words, a lot of governments, an increasing number of governments in the world, Iceland's done this, New Zealand's done it, uh, Scotland, uh, Finland, Wales, Canada, have put the idea that the your success of a country doesn't depend on your GDP and your economic growth. It's about a broader context of parameters that comes by well-being. And so increasingly, I think we're gonna be judged against about how we're delivering well-being a part of which will be economic well-being, but not only that. And so we need to be bringing out those aspects of geology that actually touch on people's well, well-being. So medical geology is a good example that actually a lot of the geochemistry that we do fundamentally looks at you know, the, the health of the soil, and that could be for human health, but it also could be, feed into food uh, security, which leads to aspects around hunger and, and poverty. So I think that that notion of bringing these narratives out is really uh, critical. And so my final slides really is, we tend to be fixated by the SDGs and most of the organizations we work for tend to you know, have targets, fit into the SDG targets, but the SDG targets are only to 2030 and they're just a, a kind of menu board of, of kind of wood likes. They don't deal with the physical dynamics of the planets we're, we're in. So I think as geologists, um, I think we have to say, yes, of course, we have to, you know, fit match what we're doing to the SDGs that are an important template, a reference framework. But I think we need a narrative that also looks forward, way forward and says, it's about the planet. We need to maintain the planet's integrity and the integrity of the, the earth systems, the services that it provides, if those sustainable development goals are going to be actually really delivered for long term. And so for me, the overarching narrative for geology, for geoscience, for earth science, is for planetary and human well-being. 
and uh, and I'll leave it at that and have a have a chat around those issues. Thank you very much for listening.